So good afternoon, everybody. I know you just had dinner, and we just had a, a great presentation from the majority leader in the House, but I'm hoping we can get a little bit more energy than that. So good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> so that was much better. <laughs> Uh, so we're here today to talk about the value of medical innovation to patients, economies, and society. My name is Mark Booten. I'm with the National Health Council, which is an umbrella organization of patient advocacy organizations that provides a united voice for people with chronic disease and disabilities. And for a lot of you, you're probably sitting there saying, well, that's interesting. We have a patient advocate on the medical innovation team moderating. I actually think that's a really, really cool sign. I'm really pleased that Farmer has asked me to do this. Typically, we would see a researcher or a scientist or an industry person moderating a committee like this. Um, but we have a terrific expert panel. But I wanted to give you a sense of why this is important. And we've had a number of stories shared with us today that I think have been incredibly profound. But from a patient perspective, one of the things I like to say is we want access to everything that you make. We want you to make it better, and we're conflicted because we often don't want to pay for it. So there's a real challenge here. But as a patient advocate, when you are somebody you love is diagnosed with a chronic condition, you suddenly want to make sure that they have access to the best treatments that are available. Um, but as somebody who has been a patient advocate now for about 25 years, you learn really quickly that for many of the people you care about, access to what exists is often not good enough. And I'll just share my story briefly with you. I grew up in northern Maine in a place where most people didn't have electricity or running water. In fact, the water we used in our house was brought in from the lake. I left home when I was um, almost 14 was fortunate enough to win an essay contest that actually put me in Denmark for a year. And I've been on my own ever since. I was very, very fortunate, but while I was living in Europe, I went to school, actually uh, received a law degree from a university in the UK. Um, but everybody in my family uh, became sick at a, almost the same time. So the conditions range from heart disease, uh, cancer, neurologic conditions, autoimmune, and rare disease. So I moved back to the United States. I actually started practicing law in Boston and began as a volunteer with a number of the patient organizations. And this is going back again about 20, 25 years ago. It was amazing what limited voice we had, both when it came to access to care, but also in the improvement of treatments and the delivery systems that supported us. You know, I held the hand of my father as he passed away from cancer and watched multiple people in my family uh, suffer and die as a result of their condition. You know, with my father, he benefited by living multiple years with his cancer, largely because of the treatments that you produced. But I can assure you that the treatments were far from perfect. The quality of his life was dramatically impacted. So as a patient advocate, we are extremely interested in ensuring that the products that you make are available and accessible to us. But we're also incredibly committed to working with you to help improve those products and really make them better. Similarly, we're equally interested when it comes to medical innovation in ensuring that the delivery systems evolve to improve. You know, as I sat there with my father as he took his last breath, told him I'd take care of my mother. My mother had been suffering from three conditions. She was diagnosed with anxiety after he died. And her conditions seemed to me to be very consistent with heart disease. I had several conversations with her doctor. Doctor said, no, it's anxiety, and kept prescribing medicine for anxiety. On my birthday, she got up and was feeling lightheaded, and she passed as a result of a heart attack. This was a system, a delivery system, that was not accounting for her symptoms, largely because she was a woman with heart disease and it was not recognized by the system. So we have tremendous opportunity to make treatments better, to improve the delivery of care, and to really identify how we can move this forward collectively with multiple stakeholders working together. 
One of the things that excites me about this panel is I want our expert panelists here who have come from multiple perspectives to really identify what is value in medical innovation to them. We have very different perspectives on what that can mean. But at the beginning, let's identify what that value is. But then let's also look at what are the challenges to accomplishing medical innovation or value in medical innovation. And then lastly, let's look at what are the solutions that we can come together to achieve that. So I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and to briefly describe in their own words what medical innovation and value mean to them. So Amy, if you would start. Hello, I'm Amy Abernathy. I am a hematologist, oncologist, and clinical researcher at Duke University. And I direct something called the Center for Learning Healthcare. Now, what's learning healthcare? It, this is uh, the approach to systems of care where research and clinical care are better approximated so that they each inform the other. And really, when I think about learning healthcare systems, it, it's ultimately trying to optimize the healthcare delivery system as well as our research system so that value is best derived for patients that we care for. What is value to me? Um, you know, I'm going to think about it from the standpoint of being a person who's a healthcare user, so I'm a patient. I'm an oncologist, so I'm a healthcare provider. And I'm a part of the community and society at large, and I'm also a clinical researcher. And at the end of the day, value to me is health, where health is defined by personalization of my care so that the treatments I receive are directed towards what I need for my per personal illness and my personal consequences and story. It's defined by giving me more time to do the things that matter and not to focus specifically only on my health every single day. And value is defined also by confidence as both a patient and a healthcare provider that I have confidence that what I'm receiving is the right thing for me. So it really goes back to the ability to have the technologies that make personalization cap capable. So uh, I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of a think tank here in Washington, the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. We think about and write about innovation policy, including in the healthcare sector. And uh, I, too, am a doctor, uh, but not of medicine. Uh, so uh, I don't know if that qualifies me to say anything. Uh, I, I do, I do uh, know about economics, so, so that, that's really what I would uh, argue, because I, I'm just really not qualified to talk about diseases in, in any sense. But I think the value of this, we have to think about it also, uh, and I use the word also, uh, from the economic benefits of this. Uh, there have been a number of studies that have come out in the last year and a half that are, we've written about on our, on our website, itif.org that make a very uh, clear uh, and compelling case for the economic benefits of pharmaceutical innovation. Uh, now clearly there are massive um, health benefits, that's the whole point, but there are economic benefits that go along with that. And there are two principal kinds of benefits. One is just simply in terms of being able to uh, treat diseases more effectively and raise uh, overall human uh, productivity over the lifetime. And the second is the direct benefits from the industry itself. Let me just give you one good example of a study that just came out two weeks ago, um, a study uh, done uh, by several economists in Sweden. And they looked at uh, how Swedish healthcare results would be if they were using uh, drugs only before 1997. So assuming that there had been no innovation since 1997. Uh, and, and here's what they found. Um, they found that if no drugs had hit the market between 97 and 2010, which was the last year of the data they collected, uh, Swedes would have spent 12% more time in hospitals. Uh, the average life expectancy would have been six months uh, less. And that uh, the total taxpayer cost for this extra added uh, uh, six months of life was $223. So a pretty uh, cheap, uh, that's uh, $40 a month, I think. So from a kind of just pure economics perspective, it's a pretty compelling case that life sciences innovation can play an important role. Um, I think the other big part of this that, that tends to be overlooked, I think, is just the critical role that the life sciences uh, industry, including pharmaceuticals, plays in U.S. competitiveness and jobs. Uh, we lost a third of our manufacturing jobs in the 2000s, and yet we only lost 1% of our pharmaceutical jobs, and that was largely just due to higher productivity. 
This is a sector that is still strong, uh, the U.S. is still strong in. Uh, fundamentally, it supports about 5.8 million jobs in the overall economy when you include uh, linkages and others. And uh, the other thing about this that's increasingly important is that the wages in the sector are approximately twice as high as the average wage for other jobs in the U.S. economy. So when we think about life sciences innovation, I think we have to think about not just um, uh, and, and clearly the, the medical benefits are, are the major thing, I don't, don't get me wrong on that. But the advantage is that we have these ancillary benefits that are, that are, pretty, good, that are pretty important and I think going to be more important to the U.S. economic health as we go forward. Hi everyone, I'm Mitch Horowitz. I'm the Vice President and Managing Director of uh, Battelle's Technology Partnership Practice. So Battelle itself is the world's largest nonprofit independent R&D organization, and our group uh, at Patel really works with communities across the country and increasingly across the world to engage around innovation. So I'm going to take a little bit of a page from what Rob was saying in terms of where the value of medical technology is and kind of both draw on the experiences in the U.S., but then also thinking about the work that we've done across the world in places like Indonesia and, and Jordan and, some in, in, and recently in Australia and other places. And I think one thing that is true for the U.S. is that when you think about the value of medical technologies and what it can do for people's lives, there's actually a great alignment here where both patients, the industry, the economy, society is really aligned around innovation. And so I agree with what Rob was suggesting which is that when you think about where we get benefits in this country from medical technology, it's not just what's here today, it's what's coming. So I'm going to give another uh, set of statistics that, instead of looking back, looks forward. So OECD did a study looking forward into 2030 and asked the question, where is the new, pro you know, where is revenues going to come from in terms of um, uh, pharmaceutical industry? And what they found was that about 80% is going to come from commercializing the science that has already been discovered moving forward. And so just from existing science, no less the breakthroughs, we can already tell that innovation is going to carry it. And in the U.S., that innovation not only benefits us in terms of our, pay, you know, for patients, and as folks talked about earlier today, I don't know if it was in the main session or, or at one of the panels I was listening in on, you know, if we don't come up with cures for things like Alzheimer's and other really chronic diseases, it's going to just eat away at the cost of our overall um, health care system. We can't afford it. The only way we're going to address those issues is if we come back and actually bring forward those cures. So those cures are happening here in the U.S., a uh, disproportionate amount, and so we benefit not only from having the innovation drive our industry, but it also serves our patients and ultimately benefits our society. And so I think that's really so much about what the value of medical technology is for us. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> Tom Phillips, and I'm an economist at the University of Chicago. I've been there about 25 years, roughly. I'm also a founding partner of a company called Precision Health Economics, which works with many of life science companies here today as their clients in generating evidence on health economic issue, which essentially we're merging a bunch of academics who can't who have good ideas with uh, people actually can run projects on time. And so we have a professional staff of about 70 people coupled up with a lot of bright minds around the country to try to help the life science companies come up with better evidence. So I'm going to talk not so much what I think about the value, but more about what my profession think about the value of, the, of medical innovation. And in the last, I guess, 10 or 15 years, there's been an emerging literature in economics that have indicated that medical the advancement in health, essentially, partly but not fully driven by medical innovation, but more so recently, the investment in health has, has been probably more important than any other type of innovation. Uh, what do I mean by that? So if you look at the last 100 years, the growth in longevity from, let's say, 44 to 78 years of living, if you value that in standard ways that economists value health, 
That is uh, equal roughly in magnitude to the value of GDP growth per capita in the population. So all the innovations that we think drive GDP growth, so pick your favorite ones, whether it's the railroad or internet or what have you, together amounts to the value generated by actually living, um, almost doubling life during that period. So a lot of us like living a lot, and that shows up in economic estimates of the value of uh, longevity. But if you bring that to bear and compare it to the, the value generated by all other types of innovations outside medical innovation, uh, that's on par. So one can, one can argue in a, in a quantitative sense that uh, medical innovation is probably the most important type of innovation that there may be around. The second aspect of this is that it also changes how we view the world if the world is becoming a, a more equal place or a more unequal place to live. There's research indicating now that in GDP, GDP growth, essentially, the world is not converging. That is to say, the poorer countries are not catching up with richer countries in their economic growth. However, if you include health assessments in those growth measures, you will find that the world is becoming a lot, for a, a lot more equal place over time as opposed to unequal place, mainly because poorer countries have benefited far more in health or, or gained in longevity in particular <clears throat> than richer countries have. And that innovation or that gain in the poor, in the poor part of the world comes from, a lot of it comes from uh, reductions in child uh, mortality or infant mortality and the expanded program on immunization is, is sort of central. Those innovations that were made essentially for rich populations but then distributed in those poorer countries is a big contributor to that, ec that additional longevity in those poorer countries. So medical innovation, heck, bottom line is that it can be viewed as <clears throat> probably the most important type of innovation and also that it also changes dramatically how we view the world if it's actually diverging or converging in terms of economic uh, well-being. So I'm listening to each of the panelists and hearing a lot of agreement that there's a great deal of value in medical innovation. I'm seeing no objections to medical innovation, which I think gives us an exciting starting point. But one of the challenges we have when we look at medical innovation is that we address innovation in the future. Uh, when you look at medical innovations, they tend to take a long time. Certainly in the biopharmaceutical industry, you're talking 10, 12, sometimes 15 or more years. Device and diagnostics seems to be a bit quicker. Delivery systems seem to be incredibly slow to change, although we're seeing some progress in that. One of the challenges I think we have when we start to look at medical innovation is we all agree it's a good thing, but how do we incentivize it and promote it and make it better. So when you look at this, um, I like to break this down into simple bite-sized bits. And we have a framework at the National Health Council we call the Arc of Public Engagement. And if you want to engage in some activity to actually improve it, you really break it down into three bites. First bite is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You need to have an understandable problem. And with that, you need to have a solution that is believable. And it needs to be important enough that people will take action. When I think about medical innovation, it is incredibly salient. People are interested in it, they'll take action. Our challenge really deals with the first two issues. What are the barriers to actually promoting medical innovation? And what are the solutions? And so I've challenged the panel to start to articulate from their perspective uh, the top two or three barriers to medical innovation. So I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to go back to the end and ask you to start. Do you want solutions as well or you just... Uh, no, let's start with the barriers first. Let's keep it... Uh... <laughs> okay, so I, I listed three barriers. <clears throat> One is which recent evidence is coming out to indicate is that the pharmaceutical and the medical R&D industry, the devices, biologics, and pharmaceuticals, have what's called a medical innovation premium in asset markets. What does that mean? That means that roughly the rate of return that you need to pay your investors if you're involved in medical R&D 
is on average three to six percent higher than if you're in another industry. So why does this industry have to pay their investors a premium uh, for investing in them? Well, most economists think that that's compensating for something. Otherwise, everyone would invest in, in the medical R&D sector and make three to five percent more. So what's the risk, essentially, that this must compensate for? And there's a lot of evidence now suggesting that there's, the, this has a lot to do with government risk. That is to say, this is an industry that both in the approval of their products, but also in the payment for their products, have a lot of risk, a government risk associated with it. We saw that a little bit with ACA's sort of slowing down R&D investments in the US, but the other forms of, of, of risks as well. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what can be done about that, and, but that's, that's a fact that's been established, that if you're in this industry, you have a higher cost of capital of doing medical R&D, uh, and the question is, what is it that, that requires you to pay investors more than in other industries? And uh, a likely suspect is, is government risk. The second, asp uh, the second hurdle, I think, is what I call sort of the cost-effectiveness movement. I'm a health economist. People think I believe in cost-effectiveness. I do not think that medical products should be cost-effective. Now, that might seem a little crazy. Uh, aren't you an economist? Uh, so what do I mean by that? Well, we could make uh, most uh, products cost-effective by just having generics coming in day one. That would lead to increased cost-effectiveness. No one would think that was a particularly desirable policy solution to increase cost effectiveness. So the point, the point, the point is essentially, uh, and we were not very popular, PHE, my company was involved in, uh, in uh, recommending to NICE in the UK how they can change their reimbursement system away from cost effectiveness based. But the point is that cost effectiveness is essentially just a price control in the sense that effectiveness is given by the compound and then the cost is given by the price. And if you're pushing down on cost and get better cost effectiveness, you're essentially just limiting the value of the innovative return. So I think there's other methods that, by which public sectors should pay and get out of the way of reimbursing, reimbursing based on cost effectiveness. And we can talk about some of those uh, solutions. To uh, speed up a little bit, the third, you said two or three, so I, I picked three. <laughs> uh, the third one is obviously the imbalances in Medicare. That's not... We have a growing Medicare population, even without the baby boom, because of falling fertility and increased longevity over time. Uh, we have uh, essentially as unsustainable uh, per capita growth in the program. So the program spending is number of people times per capita spending. Both components are growing. We have per capita going about per capita spending growing about two or three percent faster than the economy. The GDP growth that is the tax base of the young people paying for the program. <clears throat> so I think that's, that's a major threat to what do we do about the downward pressure on reimbursements, which we're already seeing, whether it's for technologies or services, that will ultimately be the result of uh, fiscal imbalances. We're seeing it uh, 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 very clearly in Europe, obviously, in those countries that have been affected, but the US is about half of Turns out U.S. is about half of world spending now in healthcare, even though U.S. is about a fifth of the world economy. So if things start getting imbalanced in the U.S., it affects the innovators in this room a lot more than if it happens in Greece. And we can talk about some of the issues or trying to resolve that problem going forward. Terrific. Mitch? Excellent. So, you know, when you start to think about uh, barriers, I think it's first important to lay the groundwork about what has been the success that we've had. And I think that in many ways in the U.S., we've earned our way to uh, uh, excellence in medical innovation. In fact, it's through medical innovation that we've really become the premier biopharmaceutical um, uh, driver in the world. And when you think about what that is composed of, it's a you know, federal investment in R&D, it's having good technology transfer, it's having the right kinds of regulatory policies, having the right kinds of incentives and um, and pursuing R&D, and then, of course, having a, a real marketplace where um, innovative drugs could really be accepted and, and move forward. And so, in some ways, the question about where the barrier is is kind of who you are and where you sit in that ecosystem of what drives innovation. So, you know, I'm sure if we had um, 
you know, and maybe as, as Amy goes through it, if, you know, if, if you're an academic, you know, you're going to have a little bit more perspective. You have three economists. We outnumber the academics here, um, <laughs> though I'm obviously uh, uh, Tom is an academic as well. But I think, I think, you know, when you stop and ask the question, so what really, really matters at the end of the day about bringing forward innovation? Um, we, we just had an opportunity to complete a report that asked that exact question to industry strategic planning executives. Um, and uh, it's a, called the U.S. Biopharmaceutical Industry Perspectives on Future Growth and Factors That Will Drive It. And I think it's actually on the website um, now. And what we asked those key executives who lead strategic planning, and so just think about it for a second. It's like treating the U.S as um, a place to do business, the operating environment, and looking at the U.S. compared to other places as well, sort of like the difference between, you know, are we going to drive a Mercedes or a Lexus or an Infiniti? You know, what, is, what matters in attributes um, that gives the best value in that business environment in different countries? And when they came back and they talked about the U.S., they basically raised three key challenges. One is, and I'm very interested in hearing uh, uh, Th Thomas's uh, um, perspectives, which was, you know, the coverage and payment policies that support and encourage medical innovation. That is an incredible both incentive and barrier if those things are at all questioned in the U.S. So if, if what we need to be doing is making sure that we have supportive U.S. government policies and that we also have broad patient access to actually getting these new innovative drugs that are moving forward. Second area was a well-functioning science-based regulatory system. And I think we heard uh, the FDA commissioner this morning talk about, boy, we could use more in regulatory sciences. And I think the answer is yes. And what we need to be able to do, uh, according to the industry executives, was really have a good high level of certainty in FDA review and approval processes and really bring science to informing those decisions. And then the third factor that stood out um, was strong IP protections, both here in the U.S., and that includes both um, patents as well as, as um, data protections, but also abroad because it's very hard to engage in selling products overseas if you are concerned about um, how they're going to treat your products in terms of IP protections and things. So when you look at those three factors, what's interesting is we had a, a speaker from uh, the National Venture Capital Association, and they asked biotech investors, I had forgotten about this study, and what they came back with is two big issues that were holding them back from investing um, in, in emerging bioscience companies was regulatory system and IP. So I guess we have some level of um, uh, consensus, at least from the perspective of how do we bring innovation forward. So I feel with Mitch's comment about economists, and we, we have to have some economist joke on this panel, but I, <laughs> I could tell you several, but I, I'll skip for now. Um, I think one way to think about this question, I'm going to echo both what, what Tom and Mitch have said, but one way to think about this is to compare this industry with, say, the Internet industry. Uh, and, and to me, they're fundamentally different industry in terms of how they innovate. And, and I think in some ways it's not surprising that there's been an enormous array of innovation in the Internet industry because if you think about what their conditions are, they're very different than the pharmaceutical life sciences industry. First of all, the costs of innovation for life sciences are going up and the cost of innovation for Internet is going dramatically down. I mean, Mark Andreessen had this nice op-ed in the Wall Street Journal about just how unbelievably cheap it is today to do a Netscape. When he did a Netscape, Back in 95, they had to buy servers, they had to buy all this stuff, they had to buy software. Today, you can do it all in the cloud just for fractions of, a, of, a, you, know, of you know, pennies on a dollar. So it's just cheap to do. Um, the second thing, you know, when you think about the face Facebooks or, or uh, Instagram or any of these companies, um, they don't have to go to the FDA to get approval for their products. There's no FDA out there that says, oh, we have to monitor what you're doing. Now, some would argue the FTC would like to play that role, but thankfully they haven't played that role yet. So you don't have an intermediary that you have to go through to get to customers. And you, in the pharmaceutical industry, have to have that intermediary. And the third thing is you have customers who are relatively able to make decisions on their own. They don't have to go through intermediaries of doctors and hospitals and insurance companies. They like something, they buy it, or they 
put it on their iPad or whatever. They don't, they don't. So it's just a really easy, in some ways, innovation system. It's cheap. There's no, there's no barrier in the middle. There's no gatekeeper. And you can access your customers directly. Life sciences is a completely different industry, obviously. You have, first of all, costs that are going up. It's a lot harder to innovate today than it is uh, 20 years ago because the problems are much, much steeper. You have Mitch's problem. He talked about of IP theft. Um, there really isn't a lot of IP theft in terms of source code for Facebook or other kinds of things. There's, people try to do that, but fundamentally they're, they're, that, that's pretty safe. Whereas there's massive IP theft and, and, and forced licensing and other types of issues like that around the world, which reduce revenues to be able to innovate. Um, we have, uh, I think, serious supply problems. If you think about the sort of, sort of supply, intermediation, and then final demand, uh, I think we have serious supply problems. I was encouraged by uh, Majority Leader Cantor's comments there, but a report that we did several years ago called Leadership in Decline, um, that's what it was called, uh, looking at how other countries are funding life sciences, uh, they are vastly outperforming us in terms of putting real government dollars to this task. Uh, we talk about doubling NIH, everybody says we doubled it, we did double it, and then we stopped. And now NIH funding is a quarter under where it would have been if we'd stayed at doubling. So we haven't doubled NIH funding if you compare it to, the, if you take into account inflation and GDP growth. Um, in the intermediary area, uh, just talking about, we've missed, we certainly have problems and challenges with FDA uh, reform. But I think a growing area that I think is going to be uh, a real, real problem is as we move to uh, big data analytics, uh, there's an enormous set of opportunities there, and yet there is a growing backlash, including in Washington among regulators, to essentially limit the flow of that data under the, I think, false premise of protecting privacy. I think there's no doubt that you can anonymize this data in a very, you can de-identify uh, de this data. So I think there's real problems under that, that intermediary space. And then the last space is, um, we really don't have a market-driven healthcare system, and, and I'm not arguing we can fully get there, but uh, customers or patients don't really see the cost of what they get. They don't know quality questions as well. And so I think all three of those factors make it much more difficult to innovate in this space. And it, the good news about all that uh, is that it suggests that the natural rate of innovation could be uh, quite high, much higher than it is today if we could overcome some of these barriers. So I made a bet as the academic. I said, hmm, I think I've got three economists to my left and they're going to say the following. Um, and, and so within that bet, uh, my overarching story is translational gaps. And many of the things that we've just heard, I think, really um, contribute to the huge part of the translational gap and in innovation of getting started with discovery and developing novel products and getting them ready to be used in real people. But what Mitch pointed out was that um, if we look forward, and I think it was the forward-looking report that you pointed out, 80% of uh, new opportunity is actually going to become, come from currently available and commercializable product. And, and so how is it that we've got innovations in our toolbox and we're not getting them out there? And so if we take this and we call this the translational gaps, which are the translational gaps in terms of discovery, but then also in wide-scale use, I think there's two huge things um, to uh, consider. Um, the first is what Bob brought up, um, but you know I just want to make sure I re-emphasize, and that's the tension around misalignment of incentives. So as you think about um, the way that you described it, uh, you don't market directly to consumers as opposed to in our tech world where, where we're, we don't really have um, essentially clinicians and healthcare systems and regulators as intermediaries and payers as intermediaries. In the healthcare space, we've got a tension between essentially the provision of novel technologies and the ability to get them into wide-scale use, either because of the need for adequate evidence and or for the need of adequate funds to be able to be able to use these. And so one is this tension in terms of healthcare delivery. But I want to put another tension on the table um, in addition to the obvious tension um, in healthcare delivery and consumers, and that's the tension of complexity. Mm -hmm. So 
In 1997, I can remember being pimped. So you remember pimping is that thing where um, the uh, lead professor starts pushing everybody, all the residents and all the fellows, and I can remember being pimped about um, a number of different biomarkers in oncology. And we would look at the flow analysis and, you know, quick, tell me what CD127 does. And, you know, whoever was the coolest knew the answer. And I remember I only had one sheet of paper that I had to have somehow be ready for by 4 p.m. that day. And I remember sitting there watching as STI 571 um, came into being, the first paper in the New England Journal, with less than 50 patients um, and a remarkable finding of a drug that was ultimately renamed Imatinib, then Gleevec or Gleevec, depending on your company or your country. And um, the way that it changed the face of chronic myelogenous leukemia. So now I needed to know a disease, a stage of a disease, a right patient population, a specific biomarker and what to ask about that biomarker, how to match it to a drug. That was 2000. And now I've gone from having essentially 13 diseases that I need to worry about to way over 250. I've got to keep that straight in my head. I've got to figure out how to talk to my patients about it. And the complexity of what's coming at, at me with new technologies and new opportunities is phenomenal, fascinating, fascinating, and just downright overwhelming. So one of the other huge translational gaps here that we don't actually often talk about in innovation is that innovation got, has got to get into hands of people to use it, and that ultimately the complexity is one of the deterrents as much as anything else in the clinic. So as I said, when you start to look at the underpinnings of the problem here, there is a great deal of elements to it, which make it incredibly complex. I just want to highlight a couple of things that are incredibly important from a patient perspective. Uh, we have absolutely seized on the issues around approval, regulatory approval, and trying to streamline that. Uh, beginning to look at issues around reimbursement, which is something that's very, very new for our community. IP and data exclusivity, huge issues. We certainly understand how strong intellectual property drives the development of treatments. We've also looked at issues around treatments that don't have strong IP. And in fact, there are many promising treatments that could be developed that would address unmet medical needs that don't qualify for a patent for any number of reasons. And in fact, if you speak with the folks in your companies that make that go, no-go decision, they'll tell you that 80 to 90 percent of the no-go decisions are not because the science isn't strong or that it might lead to an incredible breakthrough treatment for an unmet medical need, but that you simply don't have strong patents. And from a patient perspective, that makes no sense. Certainly appreciate the IP system and what is done in the development of treatments. But great science should not be left on the table simply because it has no IP. The other thing I would say with respect to this ecosystem that was raised on the big data issue is incredibly important, and that is the knee-jerk reaction to preclude the distribution of that information for privacy. Absolutely correct. When we speak with people with chronic conditions and their family caregivers, they understand that there are trade-offs. If you ask somebody if privacy is important, they will absolutely tell you, yes, it is. But they also understand the need to make trade-offs. And people with chronic conditions are often very willing to give some of their information out for the greater good if it's going to lead to the development of treatments that might help them or benefit their children. Uh, so I think we have to be really careful to push back on policies that would undermine the ability to create promising treatments. Let me ask our panelists for their two to three solutions that they think would be most important, most compelling in driving medical innovation in our current ecosystem. So I'm going to go back to the other end of the table, Tom. Okay. So I started up with this high cost of capital of the medical R&D industry. And currently we're involved. I'm a part of the Milken Institute and we're trying to develop essentially instruments for innovators to try to hedge government risk involved in developing their product, both FDA related risks such as if you think of FDA, if it's not approved, it's like a default on a loan. So there's some similar instruments to credit default swaps 
that we're thinking about developing uh, for essentially defaults on medical R&D projects or something in phase one, two, or three at FDA. Uh, likewise, the reimbursement contract or uh, futures contracts on, on uh, uh, product prices in the future does not exist in the medical product space, even though it does exist in other kind of markets. So the reason we have corn futures, or at least the reason we used to have them, was so that farmers could actually go to work and put the, the work in because they knew that they would be able to sell the output that they generated at a particular price in the future regardless of what the weather conditions, et cetera, were. So that future market is very, very analogous to uh, that kind of investment by farmers is very analogous to R&D investments in general. And I think a future markets for medical products would be extremely valuable, especially in the government situations we are now where we have no idea what reimbursements are going to be for Medicare, Medicaid, or around the world, dependent on all kind of political risk, which is very, very hard to hedge. So I think better instruments to, to hedge medical R&D risk is, is essential to develop. The second aspect on the cost-effectiveness movement, I think, <coughs> essentially, uh, I think it's uh, not useful to have uh, bureaucrats like myself when I was at CMS uh, trying to determine what the value is of certain medical products, which is sort of what uh, the cost effectiveness based reimbursement gets into that business. I actually, even though there's a lot of problem with our Medicaid program and Medicaid rebates, I think that's actually a very, very useful model for the U.S. because it essentially allows the private market to set the prices of products and then free ride off that knowledge to set the public price, in this case the Medicaid rebate. So I, I think in terms of tying public prices to private prices is a much more useful model for public price setting than it is for bureaucrats to set kind of uh, thresholds based on budget pressures within their governments for cost effectiveness thresholds like they do in the UK and other countries. The third threat in terms of the imbalance, I think sooner or later we probably will have to talk about means testing uh, Medicare. Uh, in terms of innovation, there's a sort of a non-obvious relationship between the size of a government program and the incentive to innovate. If you expand the poor part of a program, which we're, which we're doing with ACA a lot, we are Medicaid expansions and we have subsidies for poor people, that is presumably pro-innovation because you're getting customers you otherwise wouldn't be getting who are not buying your products. Most industries would be delighted if the government paid poor people to buy their products. However, if you expand into the rich populations with the program, that means many times that you lower innovative returns because the private prices they would be paying would be higher than the government price that they're forced into. So essentially, the innovative returns look like a hill as a function of the, how big of the chunk of the income distribution you have in the program. Initially, with Medicaid expansion, et cetera, your innovative returns go up. But once you include the middle class and the richer part of the population, you're now knocking down innovative returns because Medicare is paying less than the private market. So in terms of Medicare, I think means testing would raise innovative returns for the industry by essentially letting the, the private market set prices freely for the, for the upper part of the income distribution and still subsidizing like we do in the non-elderly population, the poor part of the population. The non-elderly population in the U.S. is sort of innovation on steroids where we have private pricing for the richer part of the population, but we have subsidized care for the poorer part of the po population. That, if that was mimicked for the older part of the population, I think it would both lower future public or federal balances, but also at the same time stimulate uh, innovation. Now, the savior in all this, in, uh, from all the pressure in the rich countries, I think, is, of course, China. So all the troubles we're having in Europe and the U.S., hopefully in 10 years, will be swamped by, um, if you're innovating today, you're innovating for 10 years from now. So in that time period, uh, hopefully we will have enough economic growth in, in the emerging markets to make up for what looks like a bleak future here in the richer part of the world. So when you think about how to 
solve problems. Again, I think you need to look at where you are in the ecosystem. I think all parts of the ecosystem can be improved. And uh, I think what Amy was suggesting in terms of the translational issues, well, you know, not only has the federal government been thinking about it, but actually states have been working really hard at those kinds of issues. And in those kinds of uh, state laboratories, you know, just on the translational s side, finding ways to create more interaction between industry and universities on the ground, um, I think is a very effective mechanism. I know Indiana's going through a major um, initiative on that. And those kinds of things can be meaningful because it actually creates the um, interrelationships between um, how you move technologies out of universities and then ultimately how do they get into companies that can actually bring them to market. Um, R&D incentives are really important, um, and those things um, definitely need to be addressed here. Rob's organization has done some great work um, about the value of the R&D tax credit and having uncertainties around it. But I'd, lo I'd love us to go a lot further um, in making innovation pay. Um, um, Thomas was suggesting there's some opportunities to how do you address on the reimbursement side, maybe if we make innovations um, and you bring more resources earlier on and, and support as they meet milestones, then in fact you're going forward. And one, one great idea might be something like a patent box idea where, you know, if, if it's invented here and you're bringing it to market, you actually um, uh, continue to get um, breaks in terms of being able to uh, lower taxes and other kinds of incentives. And maybe we can do that all, all the way across the paradigm of the translational um, development uh, process. But again, I think we need to come back to like, what matters to industry. And I say this because um, as much as we work with academics, um, they never bring a drug to market. Um, at the end of the day, um, you have to have a, a means to bring it to the marketplace. And so I think that, you know, first, we need to look at our competitors. Um, we can't simply say we have a good enough system. And on things like IP, um, we need to be able to keep asking the question, what's the right trade-off in terms of uh, um, length of, of our IP uh, periods and, and then moving into generics? Um, how do we manage these processes? How do we ensure, given the real complexity and costs, that in fact we have a real debate about it? Um, on the issue of regulatory um, system, and you know, clearly there's already been a lot where uh, there's been a lot of consensus that's been reached in recent years. We just need to see it through. Um, you know, there's no sense setting policies if we can't actually have it happen. But I think something that um, could really move this stuff forward is that if you go to the academic world, there's very little regulatory science. Um, you know, to the credit of FDA, they're actually partnering right now in Arkansas where the National Center for Toxicology Research is located and the University of Arkansas Medical Sciences is creating a program in regulatory sciences. Boy, we should be supporting regulatory sciences in every university. We should be having regulatory sciences like we have genomics and systems biology and it should be seen as a hot area of science because if we don't have better tools and technologies going forward and good ideas about how to take some of the best science to apply in, in these ways, then we're not going to get ahead of the curve. Um, and then ultimately on the um, reimbursement, I don't know that there's any easy answers. I, I, I didn't get a chance um, to sit in on the earlier session on the value of um, biopharmaceuticals and how to really think about it. Um, I, I thought there were some pretty interesting ideas uh, that, that, that uh, uh, Tomas had. What I do know is that we better figure it out. I mean, so whether it means having a period of time where everybody knows you have five to ten years to show the effect effectiveness of a drug that has gone through review where, you know, as, as we've been all talking about, it's no longer just around uh, safety and efficacy but it's also this risk benefit from, with a lot of engagement with patient groups as well, we need to give innovation a chance to prove itself. And so we need to think through how we do that within an overall um, reimbursement system and whether it needs to be subsidized to, in order to have that happen or simply allow for um, patient groups to be able to say, here's an exception for a good period of time and then collect all the great data. And I love what 
uh, Tomas was saying about the difference between cost effectiveness and, and, and value, and sometimes cost effectiveness is, is just too short-sighted. We need to figure it out, and so I don't have a simple answer on that, but boy, that's something that I think is really important to work on. So I'll echo a little bit of the, Tomas and, and, and Mitch, but um, one way to think about this, I, I wrote an article in the last issue of a journal called the Journal of Global Policy, and it was a special issue on uh, innovation, sort of global innovation questions, and I tried to uh, do an ambitious piece, which was how do we maximize global innovation, and I think the lessons from that broader piece apply to life sciences, and I said it really requires three big things, maximizing market share, global, global market size, because pharmaceuticals and biotech have declining marginal costs. You spend a lot of money up front, and the, the drug or the tablet, whatever it is, the, the uh, injection is quite cheap compared to the, all the fixed costs. So bigger market sizes mean overall higher profits to get reinvested relative to, say, like, to the shoe industry. The second is to limit unfair and excess competition. Unfair and excess or subsidized competition eat into those Schumpeterian profits and you can't reinvest. And I think we see that all around the world with mandatory licensing that ends up creating generics ahead of their time and forced uh, IP theft, which are essentially just create artificial competition. And the last, obviously, is IP protection. So I think on that point, uh, I think one of the things that we need to do a lot better to maximize uh, life sciences innovation, not just here but around the world, is really take a step up our, our game in terms of protecting IP around the world. Uh, I don't think we do anywhere near good enough. There are very few penalties really for countries that are IP scoff laws, whether it's in life sciences or other areas. Um, second area, I just would, would um, second what Mitch said about tax. Uh, uh, Majority Leader Cantor alluded to the uh, CAMP uh, Tax Reform Act, uh, which has a many, I don't know if you, how many you follow tax policy, many uh, very good provisions in the act, uh, but it has a very troubling provision, and that is that it dramatically cuts the value of the R&D tax credit and, and uh, R&D expensing. And we have a piece coming out on Monday that estimates that it's about a 20 billion, with a B, increase in taxes on U.S. innovators. Uh, that's a major, major tax increase on U.S. innovators. Um, so I think um, rather than cutting the R&D credit, uh, we should follow the path of what other countries are doing, which is to dramatically expand their tax incentives. Uh, you, you go to a country you know, like, like uh, France, for example, or, or India, or many countries around the world, you, you'll get an R&D credit that's four or five times more generous than what you'll get here in the U.S. Uh, and related to that is the patent box. So you can follow a country like the UK where corporate taxes on patented, patented income is 10%. Uh, we wrote a big report on patent boxes about a year and a half ago that articulated we could do something like that. And then the third one I would just argue is I think it will be an issue going forward though, and that's this attitude in, uh, around data. Uh, I actually disagree with you a slightly, Mark, on the sense of uh, thinking about it as trade-offs because I actually don't think there are trade-offs. Uh, I think trade-offs imply that there's some loss or risk, and uh, not to say that there can never be that, but if you do data anonymization in the right way, uh, there really are no risks. The risks are infinitesimal that you can re-identify. Happy to argue with anybody about that because a lot of mythology about that, particularly around the, the, the Governor Weld case in Massachusetts, which is, you really dig into that case, you find out why that was able to be re-identified because his, his treatment was in the newspaper. Uh, so you, you weren't really going to Apple. So I just think this whole point, we really need to fight back against this notion that we shouldn't be building big, giant databases. I know that sounds scary, but we really need to be building big, giant databases to mine for medical innovation. And we can do that in a way that completely protects and anonymizes individual patients. So yeah, I don't, people wouldn't know what my data is, but we'd be able to use my data and your data. Just quickly for Amy, um, uh, gives her solutions. I, I completely agree. The um, perspective of the patient when we did our focus groups was they were willing to make the trade-off for their information to become public. Uh, and I think that's a really important understanding. If you have 133 million people living with one or more chronic diseases, and the common sense that is coming out of that is, I'm willing to make that trade-off, and yet we can build this and actually protect it. It absolutely underscores the fact that we have to do this. We need to use that information to develop better treatments. 
Sorry. Thanks, Amy. Absolutely. Cool. So, you know, if we go back to um, highlighting the fact that within the context of the value of innovation and what are some of the barriers and talking about that as translational gaps, um, there are three key things that I pointed out. One was um, the need to accelerate R&D. Um, two was the need, need to align healthcare delivery with uptake of innovation so that as innovations uh, and novel technologies come out, there is a way to actually get them within the delivery space. And the third was complexity and to deal with the complexity. In 2007, the Institute of Medicine published a report on building um, a better healthcare system by building learning healthcare systems. Essentially, learning healthcare system uh, approximates research and clinical care so that each informs the other and, and does so through the alignment of patients, policymakers, clinicians, and all the elements of the healthcare delivery force, as well as um, the research and the life sciences, and does so through data and technology. And, and technology is a key substrate. Um, without data, a learning healthcare system is, is not possible. Through the alignment of processes and incentives, um, through making sure that we've got the right kind of governance and trust, and um, through ensuring that all members of the ecosystem are working together um, to support research and to support the integration of research into clinical care. One of the things that we've really focused on in the last uh, four or five years is moving forward with the learning healthcare system story and saying, by the way, the story of building and conducting a learning healthcare system actually needs to be for patients centered on patients and ultimately recognizes how we build around that as our primary urgency. And what's interesting is that if we think about ourselves as patients as well as patients being the group of people that we serve, it becomes much easier to align incentives around the people that we care about most as well as the people that uh, ultimately are going to use the products and solutions that we develop. So within that context, I, I bring forward three uh, key solutions to some of the innovation issues that we've um, highlighted. One is um, that uh, we need to make sure that the process of research and discovery is as closely approximated with healthcare as possible. Uh, for example, um, one of the things that we've been working on for a while now is even in our phase one, two trials, thinking about what's the quality measure that's going to go along with this trial if this new discovery um, meets uh, approval and is ready um, to go into wide scale use. How do we actually support understanding of implementation and optimizing implementation? So we actually have to have both the process of discovery and delivery lined up and most practically lined up through data and through the acquisition and monitoring of data through processes such as electronic health record, et cetera. The second is that um, we need to make sure that we're doing the work in our discovery that matters to the people who are ultimately going to be um, listening. When we think about drug discovery, we're often um, doing the work with, for example, the FDA as the core constituency. But remember, past the FDA, the core constituency is essentially patients, providers, and payers. And so making sure that that conversation is early in the development process and not way too late is pretty critical here. Um, I was recently involved um, in the development process um, of a drug for anorexia cachexia. We're involving patients early in that development process meant people told us, you know, actually being hungry matters. And hunger became a core concept that otherwise would never have been um, a part of that development story. And the third is we've got to deal with the complexity. The more technology I've got, the more new things that I've got to use, I've got to figure out when to use them and how. And unless we can make sure that we're developing clinical decision support solutions that aren't just noise but actually make it easier to take care of patients and give us more time with patients rather than take up our time it's really going to be very hard to take novel solutions into the clinic. And so fundamentally, we've got to make sure technology is working for us, solution finding, clinical decision support, and actually getting technology to the people who need it when. One of the things that always strikes me is that we make patients come to the clinic when we can interact with them at home, which means that we need to build the technologies to interact with them at home to support discovery in that space. And we've also got to build the reimbursement and other healthcare delivery models to make it so that it fits with where people are as opposed to where we are. 
And so I think we have the opportunities in play right now to make innovation happen in a very novel way because we've got new processes, new beliefs, new technologies, but we also have to build in that system of trust. Terrific. From a patient perspective, we, we often step back and we look at these things and, and we're coming at it as an advocate. We're not researchers, we're not scientists, we're not economists, and we pull back the curtain and sometimes I feel like Dorothy in Wizard of the Oz and I see things and think, this makes absolutely no sense. And it allows us to underscore some of the, the potential solutions. So I mentioned earlier the issue around IP being an incredible driver in some instances. But there are a lot of potential products where IP does not exist and yet you have a potential groundbreaking breakthrough therapy. So we in the patient community working with our chief medical officers actually worked with a number of stakeholders from NIH, FDA companies, patient groups, provider groups, payers, and developed legislation that really started to address that issue called Modern Cures. It was filed in Congress last session. It's been refiled this session. It addressed what we call dormant therapies. It would allow you to take a medicine forward even if it did not have a strong patent or any patent at all would also allow you to develop a product that uh, might take a long time in clinical review. So for example, if you're trying to show disease modification and you have a clinical trial that takes 15 years, that's 15 years gone on your patent life. This would allow you to start the clock with data protection from the time of approval and give you predictability and certainty on the back end. It also had three provisions promoting uh, companion diagnostics so that we could tailor the medicines to the actual individual. I'm actually really excited that less than two weeks ago the president signed half of that bill into law. And I put that out there because these innovative solutions to this challenge are accomplishable. You know, the problems are complex, the solutions are complex, but there's a great deal of saliency. People want to make these changes. And there's a huge window of opportunity that is just beginning to open as we now move into the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, which increased tremendous access to care, or at least the potential for tremendous access to care, but did absolutely nothing to spur innovation. And as I said at the beginning, patients are conflicted. They want access to what you have produced, but they want you to make it better. And that window of opportunity allows us to start to look at a myriad of potential solutions that we can craft together. Another issue that I want to put on the table, and it goes to what Amy addressed, that is patient engagement. Uh, we have been working on a seven-year strategy to institute patient engagement into the FDA. And we're seeing great strides being made there, uh, a lot more opportunity to move that forward. But there's also an opportunity for us to engage with you in the development of products. You gave the example of hunger being important. There are countless examples where treatments and diagnostics have been developed to answer a problem that patients have, and by the time they are given to the patient, we learn that you answered the wrong problem. Engaging with us up front allows you to, to learn and understand and predict what are the most meaningful issues from our perspective to align that with the science, align that with reimbursement models, and to narrow the targets you shoot at. If you're gonna shoot at a medicine that costs over a billion dollars, and it doesn't address a problem we have, you've simply wasted time and money. And we see that happen. There's an opportunity to engage with us in very, very different ways, to understand what the validated methodologies are, to have FDA produce guidance on it so that you can predictably rely on it, to create safe harbors so that you are not accused of marketing to patients without an approved product. Those are all achievable solutions that start to help us address some of these issues in the innovation ecosystem. I'm going to open this up to questions from the audience. I have a couple of questions for our panel that are targeted. Um, but if you have questions, please stand up and we'll work your questions into the panel. Um, Mitch, from your perspective, you've looked at issues both domestically and globally. What are some of the key learnings globally that we could incorporate into our work here in the U.S.? Sure. So we actually had an opportunity to uh, take a deep look at a number of uh, countries around the world, both, emer both emerging as well as very well developed. 
And I think, you know, the, one of the interesting things about what you see when you look at other countries is just how much they're copying our playbook. Mm -hmm. You know, they understand what it takes to move things forward. Now, some, like Singapore, have a great opportunity to be very, very facile about it and, and move forward um, in ways that um, are more like what states here do. And so when you look at a, a place like Singapore, they can really align things pretty quickly because they have the, all the powers of being a national government, but at the same time, kind of the scale of a, of a state local government. But when you go a little deeper, what you begin to realize is that first, there are much better dialogues around what we're talking about here. Um, and I think it was actually mentioned earlier this morning, something around having a national bioscience, uh, biomedical innovation strategy. Well, other countries actually do those kinds of things. And we have such a hard time in this country getting around these issues um, when, in fact, across the, across the country, I think the last time we did this, it was well over 40 states have bioscience development strategies in place that are dealing with all these issues that we're talking about here today around innovation. But again, states can't get at these bigger issues around reimbursement, around IP protection, um, around um, um, the regulatory systems and stuff. So, so I think it's really important to kind of go there. Um, what you see as well is there's a real concerted effort on talent. We didn't get to talk about that. Obviously, we need, an, in this country, an approach not only around immigration, but even more importantly around how do we connect kids to schools. We see so much work on STEM that goes on, but the kids still don't know about what the career opportunities are. Um, I think, you know, a lot of uh, um, farmers members have really been bridging that gap, but we got to do it at a scale that's much larger than what individual companies can do. So we need to think about talent. Other countries get that, um, and they really do appreciate all the good work we do educating their foreign nationals so they can go back. Um, and they are going back in greater numbers. And that is, is something that we need to begin to think hard about in terms of how do we take our own indigenous uh, population, how do we grow our own um, around that. And then ultimately it comes down to getting this R&D um, engagement right. Um, it's in part, you know, we need to make a national commitment. Um, you know, I was looking a little bit at some of the numbers we do, the global R&D forecast um, uh, for not only the U.S., uh, but obviously global around the world. And you could see that, you know, not only is China going to catch up to us in R&D very soon, but actually when you look at it as a percentage of the GDP, we're actually slipping a bit. And so I think we need to have a national commitment and recognize it's not just the federal government, it's also having the right incentives for private sector investment in R&D. And that is such a big part of our R&D system. And then it goes beyond that, and some of the things that, that both Rob and I have been talking about, other countries are doing these things, whether it's patent box, whether it's, uh, you know, hiring, um, doing R&D and giving you incentives. I think Brazil does this, and then also allowing you incentives when you, when you hire locally trained workers to come into R&D activities. We just need to be celebrating um, those kinds of activities in this country. And when you look around the world, they're doing it and they're doing it. Some of them are at big scales. Um, and what's really concerning to me is it's not just the emerging company, uh, countries that are doing this, but it's actually very well-developed countries. So what's happening in Germany, in Japan today, uh, Rob mentioned the UK, those are the countries that in terms of a quality perspective are so close to us. If they ever get the incentives, the costs, the reimbursement, any of these things right in a way that is meaningful, you know, it's going to really make a difference. That's interesting. So Rob, you've mentioned um, data, big data. When I speak with companies, one of the things that's been interesting to me is they say that they used to know the most about their products. There was nobody else that knew as much about their products, and now that's no longer the case. Is that lack of control of the data going to impede innovation, or does it create the opportunity to actually improve innovation? I think as long as we maintain a differentiation between having strong IP protections along with open data, uh, it's absolutely going to improve uh, innovation. We 
launched a new center last year called the Center for Data Innovation, which is datainnovation.org. And uh, it, it's, uh, every week we do an email, and it's the top 10 data innovation things around the world. And you read the email, and you're just like, wow, this is, I mean, it's, 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 it's really transforming everything. And uh, I worry that it's not going to transform healthcare as quickly as it could because of all the inherent barriers and, as you alluded to, the fears we have about doing this. So, and f fears on, on, on a lot of different levels. Uh, although I have, I'm not an expert on this, but I have at least talked to companies who sound like companies are less worried about sharing their data than they might have been 10 or 15 years ago. And then the ability to sort of throw things in the pool collectively see what we learn from it, let, let it be relatively open so that researchers at Duke and other places can mine it. Uh, I, I think the overall effect is going to be tremendous if we can get it right. right. So can I just add one last thing on the, on, on abs the, on absolutely. the Mitch question? Because, uh, um, you know, one of the things that I think, I, I, I just want to underscore what Mitch said, because I think it's so easy to lose sight of this in the U.S., because we just normally, most people in the U.S. don't look at what other countries are doing. And when we look around the world and see what other countries are doing, they have strategies. Mm -hmm. And strategies have, has gotten a bad, uh, bad uh, war term in the U.S. We, we think about it as sort of heavy-handed governmental intervention, that the government's going to pick this drug and not that drug. We sort of do that anyway with payment. But the uh, point of these strategies is really they wake up every morning thinking about how are we going to turn our nation into a life science leader. And I, I, again, I look at the U.K. The U.K. is not a... They have a lot of problems in their economy, but the, one of the things the UK is doing right is they are really thinking hard about this and putting in place some amazing, amazing initiatives to do this. Um, one of them is they just launched an um, initiative, um, early access scheme, where they revamping drug approval to increase speed and efficiency of getting things to market. How long have we been talking about that? <laughs> now, again, I don't know how well it will work, but they're trying it at mm -hmm. least. They're taking the steps and trying it. The other thing they do is they're the only nation in the world that has a cross-governmental uh, office of uh, life sciences. So here, our life sciences is really determined by the FDA, and the FDA's main job is about patient safety and drug efficacy. It's not about competitiveness. I don't even know if they think about it. I don't, does anybody know, does FDA have any economists that think about competitiveness? I don't think they do. But in the UK, they've merged that. They have a, their joint um, health and business ministries now work together to say, how can we bring drugs to market that's safe for our patients, but at the same time make it so that our industries are going to be world leaders? And we should be doing that. We should have our commerce department with a real life science unit that works hand in hand with FDA and other regulators to begin to build that process in there. And we don't, we simply don't even think about it. That's absolutely right. Did you want to respond, Amy? I actually, I wanted to follow up on the data piece um, just for a moment uh, that Rob brought up. So one of the naysay um, sort of opportunities as we talk about big data healthcare is that it's nonsense, that the data we have in healthcare is um, difficult to use, it's problematic, et cetera. And it's one of been one of the places where there's been a lot of pushback within the context of trying to liberate information broadly, in addition um, to worrying about privacy and trust. But it's interesting, um, we've spent a lot of time looking at this. Um, it is indeed true that we've got problems with the quality of the information that we've got. It's often not structured, it's hard to use. Um, but the reality is um, it's becoming quite clear that, first of all, we've got progressive innovation in the development of data itself, and that's happening in a very remarkable way right now. The availability now of transformation tables that allow us to um, create equal signs between different databases at large scale, for example. Another is uh, we've progressively shown that if you give doctors back information, they start correcting it, and they get the underlying information source gets of higher and higher quality. And what's interesting is if you do that with patients, and you give patients back information who are particularly motivated to get it right, the quality um, accelerates um, yet again. So the reality is that while we do have a, pro a lot of problems with our data resources right now in healthcare, um, we think that there's good reason to believe um, that this is gonna, gonna, going to be improved. But above and beyond that, you, through your work in life sciences, can stimulate that improvement. That's a good point. So question, if you'd identify yourself. I'm Rob Wright. Uh, Chief Editor of Life Science Leader Magazine. Uh, so my question is around, and, and what got me thinking about this is I recently spoke to Annalisa Jenkins, who is the new chairwoman of Transcelerate Biopharma. And she talked to me about 
uh, the innovation R&D ecosystem and how it's changing and how you have companies like DECA uh, partnering with Coca-Cola and so forth. Mm. And so my question is around IP. Instead of pharma just thinking about um, how it's trying to protect it, about partnering with companies like GE and Walmart because those companies obviously have employees and they're paying for health insurance. And if those companies were also advocates for pharma to have better IP protection, maybe we'd have a better chance of getting better IP protection for that. So what are your thoughts about uh, an approach to doing such uh, a case study, I guess? Thanks. I think that IP is not such a is not so damaged here in the U.S. where they sell the most. I mean, I guess it would be <clears throat> the real concern with IP. I think is emerging markets if the, they are actually going to outweigh the, all the reimbursement downward pressure on reimbursement that we're seeing in the rich countries. I think that's sort of an Im important component of it. When it comes to FDA. Uh, uh, streamlining FDA, it's not necessarily clear how that if affects innovative returns. If you look at IND, if you, you, you take an IND approval and it's about a 12 to 13 percent, percent chance that that's going to result in an NDA approval. So it's a, you know, 88 percent of the time you don't make it through the whole process. That's not good if you're investing in R&D. However, it's also true of your competitors. So you have a much more protected market once you're out there because 88% of your competitors are not allowed to come in as well. So it's a sort of a dual effect of the FDA being more uh, stringent. One is that it affects your cost of R&D, obviously, but it also affects your competitors' cost of R&D. So you have a more protected market if you actually make it through. So the innovative returns, and people have looked at this, and it's not exactly clear which one is more important for those. Certainly, there would be more competition if FDA didn't take as long and didn't involve as much resources. We would have lower barriers to entry. Uh, but, you know, those innovative returns would disappear a lot quicker than sitting around until generic entry. Right now, actually, half of compounds do not face generic entry when their patents expires because they're obsolete. But if we streamlined FDA, it would be a lot larger fraction of compounds who were obsolete at the time the generics uh, potentially could come in because you would have basically lowered the barriers for your competitors as well as yourself. Does anybody else want to respond? Yeah, I think the point, though, that I think is missing there, though, is time. Uh, because if you reduce time, then you have more of a longer period to gain what are called Schumpeterian profits. Uh, so that would yeah, but counter. Your competitors are coming in quicker. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you have a longer window, but your competitors are coming in and eating at you. So most innovative returns are destroyed by therapeutic competition, not by generic competition. And if that's the case, then therapeutic competition is going to come in a lot quicker at you. But I thought actually the point that might be really interesting is companies that have very, that are basically privately funding their own health care, would they be able to kind of bring in some of these innovations and, and be really good partners? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I'm not sure it's about IP as much as it is about being able to partner with a marketplace that allows you then to show the efficacy in it and I'd rather use the word benefit risk, um, still somewhat in the old school, right? Um, in terms of being able to demonstrate that in fact a treatment really works uh, or doesn't work. And so, I mean, that could be kind of interesting. You still have to get through, I'm sure, a lot of FDA regulatory approvals before you can get there. But to be able to look at your own workforce and recognize certain kinds of issues that they face and recognize that what's out there isn't quite working very well and bringing in uh, a lot of the kinds of things that Amy's saying, and then you take responsibility for it and partnering with a, with, 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 with a, a pharmaceutical company. That could be a pretty interesting model. I haven't heard about that kind of stuff before. That might be very intriguing. Yeah, I think there's an interesting opportunity. There's a, what you're getting back to is that arc of public engagement. The problem is not well understood. If the problem were better understood and there were solutions that were believable, 
then you would have a larger cadre of people say, no, we need to protect this or accomplish those solutions. And so partnering with uh, folks that are real world people, whether it's employees or other people, people with chronic conditions, and engaging them in the process allows them to have some input into it to better understand the problem, to see the opportunity of the solution. At the end of the day, saliency is not a problem here. I don't think there's anybody who disagrees with promoting medical innovation. Now, there's a strong emphasis with that. The challenge is understanding the problem and getting your arms around the solution and having people who will stand up and advocate for it beyond just the biopharmaceutical sector. So I actually think there's, you're onto something that could be very interesting. Can I add just one piece, though? So it's not a far pivot from saying partner with the GEs and FedExes of the world to think about innovation within the space of their workforce or sort of their their ecosystem of people for whom they're responsible to uh, partnering with, for example, integrated health systems, the Geisingers of the world who've got a large ecosystem of people for whom they're responsible as well. And so, you know, I think that we're starting to see a number of novel pharma slash health system relationships starting to, to come about either because of technologies that are being developed in the academic space and trying to figure out how to accelerate those with pharma partners or um, because the academic health systems, the integrated health systems act as very natural laboratories, especially if they have, for example, single um, electronic health records or really good data systems from which you can draw to understand impact of your product. So I think that one of the ways um, to take that idea and just do one quick frame shift is to think about that partner also potentially being um, an organization that either has an at-risk responsibility for a large population as an integrated health system or um, has a um, ecosystem of research and R&D activities within it, for example, an academic health system as an integrated health system. So I have another question. I'm Ian Kramer from the LEAD Coalition, and uh, I would invite you to comment a little bit about the, the interplay between the different ecosystems. So we've talked a lot uh, over these last couple days about medical innovation, mostly around treatment and care. But I also wonder about innovation in diagnostics, trying to move this to an earlier point in the process. Uh, and, at, and at least from my perspective, not only in Alzheimer's, but in many diseases, and we heard this in the, in the patient testimony this morning around cancer, if you do a better job diagnosing earlier in the course of a disease, you give patients new options, you give their care infrastructure, their, their professional and family caregivers new options. I think you give payers different sets of questions to address, and you certainly give uh, innovators in terms of, of uh, medication a longer window of time to have an, a, a positive impact on that person's quality of life as well as duration of life. And I, I wonder if you could talk about the interplay for patients, economies, and society in the context of thinking about diagnostics as a predicate to the, to the development of new drugs. I actually think when you look at the device and diagnostic side, you're seeing more rapid um, enhancements in that area. Uh, right now you have a group called MDIC working with the FDA to identify um, how you can uh, develop engagement strategies that can be validated for purposes of approval that will shorten the approval time and actually make the devices and diagnostics more responsible, responsive to what the needs are of the patient. Um, that's something that is very interesting. They're also progressing into an area where they might see that you have 10% of the population is willing to take the risk of this particular device and address their labeling so that that 10% can actually get it, even though it would ordinarily not be approved. So you're starting to see some innovations there that I think could benefit the biopharmaceutical space. I apologize for interrupting. I just want to add one more wrinkle that I forgot to mention, which is it's, it's not only about timely and accurate diagnosis, it's also about transparency. In other words, communicating the diagnosis to the individual with the disorder so that they can use the, the information even if there is not at, at the moment, and again, I'm picking on Alzheimer's because it's what I know, but I'm sure it's true for other diseases, even at a time when there is not an, a proven effective way to intercede in the, in the disease medically so that you can choose other interventions you can that, are, that are lifestyle and so that you can choose to participate in clinical trials and advocacy and those sort of things as well. So we have a huge problem in Alzheimer's with docs knowing it's Alzheimer's or another demanding disorder and just not communicating that diagnosis to the patient because they don't feel they can cure it. 
I think and the, me the medical innovation and diagnostics is highly contingent on that we don't have value-based pricing of diagnostics right now, so that we basically have lab-based, cost-based pricing, which you can think of pricing drugs at the cost of generics when they come out, and we wonder why personalized medicine has not, you know, delivered as much as it has. So, I mean, one way to think about, the way economists would think about personalized medicine or companion diagnostics is that it basically converts from what we call a search good to an experience good to a search good. An experience good is something you have to consume to learn the quality of it. Drug is a very good example of that. Search good is basically you can tell the quality before you actually consume it, a TV, car, whatever. So what companion diagnostics do, they tell us before consumption whether this is going to be working or not for us. And the value of that is highest when, when is the value of that highest? That's when consumption is a very costly method of fi figuring out whether a, a drug is working. So therefore, it's very natural that this is now, personalized medicine is coming up in oncology where the cost of learning through consumption is by far the highest relative to many other classes. You're never going to see personalized medicine, I say, I joke around because people will remember it. You're never going to see personalized medicine in ED. Because ED is, you know, it's probably pretty fun to try if it's working or not. <laughs> <laughs> but the cost of consuming something and then dying in the process when you're on the wrong treatment in oncology is very, that's why it's being developed in oncology. And that's why they're first out the block. Because the value through learning through consumption is so high relative to learning through a diagnostic. Now those developments are not going to be, those companion diagnostics are not being developed enough because they're so poorly priced relative to the value they generate and partly because we don't understand how to quantify that value of information. It's essentially just better information. And how do you quantify that value and how do you go to a payer and say, here's the value of my companion diagnostics and certainly health economists don't have any good metrics on that and it's starting to develop now but I think we're a, w a long way from value-based pricing in, in, in diagnostics. So I'm going to ask Amy to respond to that question as well. And before she does, I mentioned the modern cures and two elements have just been enacted into law. One was the creation of a new entity with the C within CMS to bring in a group of experts to actually evaluate the value of the diagnostic and to reimburse it based on its value, not on the current process, which as you say, we've always said the diagnostics have become like the turkey on Thanksgiving. It's the loss leader. It's the part that is undervalued in the system. This will start to change that paradigm. In addition, there is language in there that would allow for a new FDA-approved diagnostic to immediately get a temporary code that would allow it to actually be used and be reimbursed. There have been some instances with advanced diagnostics actually waiting five years to get a code and therefore cannot be used, cannot be reimbursed. Uh, the component on diagnostics that has not yet been enacted is actually a component if you develop a companion diagnostic, you would get an additional six months to a year of data exclusivity on the underlying biopharmaceutical that was its companion. And so therefore you would not address the cost of the, bio, of the companion diagnostic, but it would allow you to increase your investment in the medicine. And the economists we've talked to have said that will double or triple the investment in diagnostics. So, Amy? So, we've talked a lot about um, the context of innovation and diagnostics, especially from the standpoint of um, value and payment. Um, I want to point out a couple of additional points um, in the context of innovation and diagnostics. The first is that um, there is great opportunity here as diagnostics um, proliferate um, to have innovation in the ecosystem around them. So we've mentioned matched clinical trials, but the ability to have matched clinical trials coupled with just-in-time clinical trials um, I think is going to be progressively more critical. Um, as you have uh, the narrowing of populations so that ultimately the trial gets done with 30 people because the diagnostic is identifying that single specific person. You can't have that trial open at every single site across the country. You've got to have a way of getting to the place of where the patient is with that problem quickly as opposed to making them fly to Texas at MD Anderson to get to the study. So ultimately we've got to come up with new clinical trials models um, as in that innovation space as we have innovation in diagnostics. Similarly, um, we have to have innovation 
in understanding what the information means. Um, it's pretty straightforward um, when we're developing a diagnostic um, that was specific to identifying a specific finding that we were looking for and therefore we know what we want to do with it when we find it. The real problem are the diagnostics that we have more and more of in our toolbox now that give us a whole bunch of information that we don't know what to do with. Um, next gen sequencing is both the love of my life and the bane of my existence. Um, because I spend a lot of time looking at information to, for which I don't know what it means today. I hope it might mean more in the future for this particular person. I don't have a conversation to bridge that gap for the person that I'm speaking with and or their um, healthcare funder on the phone. And um, ultimately, at the same time, I want it, my patient wants it, and the ecosystem wants it. So um, my point here being that we need innovation in the space of helping us understand and interpret the tests that are sitting in front of us, as well as innovation in the space of how we communicate with each other about what these tests mean. Um, and in the final piece there, um, within the ACA, and um, I think you brought up with your, as you were speaking about Alzheimer's, um, better innovation in the context of shared decision making is going to become more and more important even when you're developing innovative and new technologies, figuring out how we smartly have those conversations in the clinic about what this means and making this decision for you quickly because we don't have four hours for that conversation. We have five minutes for that conversation and getting to a point that makes good sense for patients and caregivers is going to be really important. Excellent. So join me in thanking the panel. I really appreciate your comments today.